Welcome back. My name is Franz Wiesbauer and I'm one of the co-founders of 123sonography.com and you are enrolled in our free training series entitled the Echocardiography Survival Kit. This is the second training video of this series. In the previous session you learned some basic principles on echocardiography. But before we start with today's teaching video I want to thank you for all the feedback. Your encouraging messages were really amazing. Keep them coming. There were some questions that were asked repeatedly, so I would like to give you a short answer here. Many people wondered if they could become true echo experts by just participating in an online training. And we have come to realize that many of you are not familiar with online courses and the tremendous power of e-learning. So let me give you some real examples of how our courses have helped some of our students. So for example, there are hundreds of students who have successfully used our courses in order to prepare for various echo exams of different societies or accrediting institutions. I have to say we have not created our course in order to prepare you for any specific tests. Instead we have created them in order to prepare you for the real world, for real world problems and real world patients. However, that being said, it seems that our courses have proven to be enormously effective in order to get you up to speed for a test. So most physicians and sonographers who learn echo from us do not need to pass a test. They learn echo because they want to become better physicians or sonographers. They want to be able to solve tricky clinical problems and most importantly, they want to become competent clinicians. If you check out our testimonials page, you will see that our course is perfect for you if you fit in this category. These colleagues all certify that our courses have helped them become true echo experts. And as if that was not enough, there are even colleagues on our testimonials page who reported of specific instances where they could save an actual patient's life because of what they have learned in our courses. Isn't that amazing? This is so encouraging for us. It shows us that our teaching methodology works really well and that we can truly help our students become better physicians and sonographers. Many of these colleagues were just like you. They were not familiar with online learning and some of them were even reluctant to get involved. Only when they tried it out they realized the power and potential of online education. So it worked for them and I promise it will work for you as well. But now enough of me, let's give the stage to Tommy Binder and today's teaching video. Enjoy the learning experience and I'll see you in the next video. Welcome back to our Echo Survival Kit tutorial on echocardiography. This is part two. In part one, you learn some very important basics. For example, how echocardiography works, what it is, which components it has and how to image. In this part, I will tell you how to determine left ventricular function and to see if something is wrong with the left ventricle or not. But first, I want to give you a very short review of what we did in the last lecture. In echocardiography, we use so-called phased array transducers or matrix transducers, which allow us to modify the imaging frequency. If we have patients who are very obese, where we need a lot of penetration, we should use low imaging frequencies. In contrast, if patients are very slim, we can use high frequencies, which allow us to get a very good resolution. There are a number of important parameters that you can set on the machine, which will make it easier for you to interpret what you should see. The gain, the depth, the frame rate, and I showed you how important it can be to use the scene function and to look at images in slow motion. We talked about the so-called bottom-up approach, which is good to use in settings where you do not have so much time to image emergency settings basically, and where the patient cannot be positioned adequately. Here you start with a subcoastal window, then use the apical window, and finally the parasternal window. But still, be flexible and use the view where you think you can see the pathology best that you need to see. We studied a number of views. Here is the first one, the subcoastal four-chamber view. the apical four-chamber view, the parasternal long-axis view, and then finally the parasternal short-axis view. But I also mentioned that there are a number of other views which are also very important. 
you will get to know some of these views in this and in the following lectures. And then finally, I demonstrated the Doppler effect, which can be used to measure blood flow velocity and which is very important to quantify heart valve lesions. I also explained that you have to be parallel to the flow of blood with your Doppler line, otherwise you will have a very large measurement error. If you want to have a more detailed review, or if you want to see one of our lectures again, just go back to your old emails, or just search on our 123sonography.com webpage. Now let me turn to the left ventricle. What you see here is the famous glass frog. It's famous because the skin of his belly is completely translucent so that you can see his inner organs, even the heart. If humans would have such a skin, we wouldn't need echocardiography, but unfortunately we do. And we need it very frequently to quantify the left ventricular function. But to truly help you understand why the heart looks the way it looks and how it functions, I want to introduce you to a very famous pathologist, to Paco Torrent Guasp, who was born in 1931 and who showed something very, very fascinating. Just with the help of his hands, he was able to dissect the heart and show that the heart was actually composed of only one band, the so-called ventricular band or helical band. If you want to see how this dissection is performed, I would recommend you to go to the YouTube channel and check out the helical heart, a truly fascinating video. There's been some dispute whether the heart truly developed only from one muscle band or not. But whatever the truth is, it just shows us that the muscle fiber spirals around the heart. Furthermore, the orientation of the fibers is different. It is more longitudinal near the epicardium and more circumferential in the mid and apical portions of the myocardium. Why is this important? It's important because the fiber orientation determines the way the heart contracts. And myocardial contraction, even though we tend to think it is, is not simply an inward motion. As a matter of fact, this is something the surgeons have known all along because when they opened the chest they saw that the heart not only beats in one direction, but that it twists and turns. Certainly the growth of knowledge of the left ventricle and the contribution of scientists such as Galen, Vesalius, Servetus, Colombo, Harvey, Malpighi or Torrent Grosp are stunning. But the question remains, how does this translate into the way we interpret echocardiographic images? And specifically, to quantify left ventricular function. But first, let's study in more detail how the heart really contracts. These animations display the directions of contraction very nicely. See how the heart twists and turns? This is a view of the heart from the bottom. And you can see that there is a rotational motion here at the apex. In addition, you can see that the heart also shortens longitudinally and that there's also a rotational motion. So in summary, what we have is we have a radial contractile component, a circumferential component, and a longitudinal component. Let's go back to our echoes. Our short axis view at the apex, the four chamber view, and a short axis view somewhere in the mid of the ventricle. And now look closely in which directions the myocardium is actually contracting. We can see this with echocardiography because we don't only see the cavity, but we also see the speckles in the myocardium and therefore how the fibers move. Here is the four chamber view. You can see the ventricle moves in this and in this direction, radial longitudinal. This is obviously radial motion in a short axis view. And if you go all the way to the apex, you can see that the apex rotates. Here is the counterclockwise motion of the apex. Based on these findings, we now know that the contraction of the heart is not simply an inward motion, but a much more complex interaction of different contractile components. With all this information in mind, let us now turn to the assessment of the left ventricle with echocardiography. When you assess the left ventricle, keep in mind that it is not only left ventricular function you should be looking at, but also at shape and size. So, one, shape, two, size, and then three function. The shape of the left ventricle. The inner shape of the left ventricle has been compared to a bullet. In geometrical terms, it has the shape of a truncated ellipsoid. 
with a more or less narrow apex and a wider body and again a more narrow ventricular diameter at the mitral valve plane. Oh, by the way, can you tell the difference between these two stained glass windows aside from the fact that the one on the left is from Germany and the one on the right from France? The one on the left is Romanesque and the right one is Gothic. You can tell by the shape of the window. This window has a more rounded top while this is more pointed. But what does that have to do with echocardiography? Because if you have the shape of a ventricle which looks like this, then you probably have what we call foreshortening. Foreshortening occurs if you don't place the transducer in the fifth intercostal space with the four chamber view, but more cranial, somewhere in the fourth intercostal space. You can see in the following demonstration what happens. So how do I recognize that there is short foreshortening? Well, the most important finding is that you have a rounded apical shape. You see, it? the apex is not pointed but round. The second finding is that you have a rather short left ventricle, especially when compared uh, to the atrium. How can you correct this? You can correct it by just moving more apically and laterally. Okay, this would probably be a better view. So this is much less foreshortening. Of course, you cannot avoid that uh, you miss some of the supraapical views, but this is certainly better than what you've seen before. If you really need to see the supraapical views, there's another trick that you can use, and that is by bringing the patient more in a position on the back and rotating the transducer very, very laterally, and then all of a sudden you will get views which are very atypical, but which do show you regions of the apex that you cannot see uh, with even the optimized four-chamber view. Here is another example. On the left, we have foreshortening, and on the right, no foreshortening. So the shape of the left ventricle can also tell you if you imaged correctly or not. From a normal left ventricle, to a diseased left ventricle. This is a patient who has dilated cardiomyopathy with significantly reduced left ventricular function. The ventricle is not only enlarged, but it also has the shape of a balloon. It is much more round. Its diameter is almost as long as its length. Even if you see a still image of this patient, you can recognize that something is wrong. Something is also wrong with this left ventricle. It's also dilated, but in a very specific way. The apex is very wide, wider than the rest of the ventricle. If there is a neck, then we call it an aneurysm. This is certainly an extreme form of an aneurysm. Here are some more examples. What you see here is an aneurysm of the apex, which is much smaller. And if you look closely, you will also see that this patient also has an apical thrombus. Here's an aneurysm located inferior. This is a two-chamber view. And this is an apical long-axis view where you can see a small aneurysm in the posterior lateral region. So the shape of the left ventricle here also denotes that something is wrong, in this case, some form of coronary artery disease. Do you remember I told you that the cavity of the left ventricle should have a more or less pointed shape? Yes, it should, but certainly not as extreme as this here. This ventricle has the shape of the spade sign. This is typical for patients who have apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. One more example. The shape of the cavity here is that of a banana. Why is that so? Because we have a very, very thick intraventricular septum especially here in the mid portions of the ventricle. This is a patient with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. This shape of the left ventricle is typical for patients with this pathology. But why do I recommend you to look at the shape of the left ventricle? First of all, it can cause problems. 
It results in ineffective contractile force of the ventricle if it is dilated. You can see obstruction to outflow in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It can cause mitral regurgitation, as you will see in the third part of the echo survival course. And you might also see a thrombi if you have an aneurysm. I showed you an example previously. But this is not the main point. I think the main point is that it helps you to survive even if image quality is poor. Here are some examples and believe me by far, these are not the worst image qualities that I've generated. Take a look at all these ventricles here. Without the ventricle moving, this patient has a problem. It is dilated. This is a very small ventricle. Something seems wrong here as well. Look at the shape of this ventricle here. The shape of a banana. And this ventricle also appears large and spherical. What do these patients have? Dilated cardiomyopathy with left bundle branch block and dyssynchronous motion of the intraventricular septum. Apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with outflow tract obstruction. And a patient with volume overload because he has severe aortic regurgitation. Size of the left ventricle. I already showed you some dilated left ventricles because the size of the ventricle is closely linked also to its shape. But here's an example of a normal on the left and a dilated left ventricle on the right. Even without measuring the left ventricle, it's pretty obvious that the ventricle on the right is dilated. But why is this so? Well, simply because we automatically compare the chambers of the heart to each other, especially the left and the right ventricle. Normally, the left ventricle is approximately one third larger than the right ventricle. In the case I showed you here, this is not the case. Take a look again at the dilated left ventricle and compare it also to the right ventricle and do the same thing for the normal ventricle here on the left. I know what you're going to say now. What if the right ventricle is also dilated? Well, then you cannot use it. Here's such an example. But you can still look at the geometry of the left ventricle and you can also measure the left ventricle. Here is how. There are numerous ways how you can measure the size of the left ventricle. You can perform distance measurements, area, volume. You can even perform 3D reconstructions and calculate the true volumes. But for a quick orientation, I think it is sufficient to just measure the diameter of the left ventricle from the lateral to the septal wall. 2D measurements of the left ventricle diameter are quite simple and easy to do. I'll just show you how one can perform this measurement. First of all, use a four chamber view, freeze the image and end diastole and also consider that the endocardium is located more medially and that this is not the endocardium here, but that this is the endocardium. And then you would just measure parallel to the plane of the mitral valve towards the interventricular septum and we will get a measurement of 46 millimeters. If you do not get a decent four chamber view, you can also perform the measurement from a subcoastal approach in a four chamber view, or you can also perform the measurement, for example, in a short axis view of the left ventricle, uh, parasternal, parasternal view. So you have more options than the four chamber view. When is the ventricle dilated? If it is above 55 to 56 millimeters. However, also consider the body surface area if the patient is very small, a diameter of maybe 50 or even 45 millimeters could mean that the left ventricle is dilated. Left ventricular function. So finally, we come to the most important question that we have to answer with echocardiography. What is left ventricular function? But how is this done? What is the best approach? There has always been a long dispute. What is better? the calculation of ejection fraction or eyeballing of the left ventricle? Well, but whatever the answer is, one thing is clear. You have to have experience. Eyeballing is probably sufficient for the vast majority of cases. What does this mean? You will need experience and lots of practice. Aside from the fact that you need to see a lot of ventricles and perform a lot of echoes, what you will need is you have to calibrate your eye. To do that, I would recommend to, first of all, look for a mentor, 
or also look for co-workers and see how they grade left ventricular function. In addition, go to lectures and conferences and use every possibility you have to see how others grade left ventricular function. In reality, if you put it on a global scale, the majority is always right. Before I show you some examples, we first need a grading scale. After all, we have to know what we will put in the report. The scale we use, which is also used in most other laboratories, is the following. Hyperdynamic, normal, mildly reduced, moderately reduced, and severely reduced. Sometimes it's also helpful to use an intermediate grading, for example, mild to moderately reduced or moderate to severely reduced. This does help because you will encounter several situations where you simply cannot put the ventricle in one or the other clear distinct category. Now some examples how I would grade the following ventricles. Hyperdynamic, normal, moderately reduced, and severely reduced. I'm sure you notice that this ventricle is very, very poor in function and that it looks completely different to the normal, to the hyperdynamic, and even to the moderately reduced. It's more difficult to determine the difference between this and this ventricle, and maybe also between this and this ventricle. But to understand what we should be looking for, a more detailed look. The first point I would like to make, in a parasternal short axis view, you will be looking at radio, so inward, and circumferential motion, rotational motion. Radial is certainly the more important one to assess left ventricular function. If you're looking at the apical long axis view, then you will also look at radial function, which is the motion inward here, but also at longitudinal function. Radial and longitudinal function can diverge. You will have patients who have normal or even hyperdynamic radial function and reduced longitudinal function. I will talk about this issue later. What should you look at when you eyeball the left ventricle? The first thing, the endocardial border, and see how far it travels inward. This is a normal ventricle. This is a patient with reduced left ventricular function. Can you see how much further the myocardium travels from diastole to systole? Look at the thickening of the myocardium. Again, a normal patient and a patient with reduced left ventricular function. Can you see that the myocardium gets thicker here? Well, it doesn't change here on the right. Both of these clues helped you to assess radial function. Now I want to help you to look at longitudinal function. Take a look at this line here. This line is placed at the annulus of the mitral valve. Here we have a normal left ventricle. Note how much this annular plane moves towards the apex or up on the image in this normal ventricle. And now compare it with this ventricle here. It hardly moves. This patient has normal longitudinal function and this patient has reduced longitudinal function. It all sounds very easy so far, but watch out that you don't get trapped like this little spider here. There are a number of pitfalls that you have to be aware of. These are the considerations. Left ventricular function appears better than it is in small ventricles. It is very difficult to assess left ventricular function in patients with left bundle branch block. Watch out for patients who have reduced longitudinal function but normal or even hyperdynamic radial function. And finally, it is very difficult to estimate left ventricular function in patients with tachycardia and arrhythmias. How does size and function relate? Does large always mean you are stronger and small mean you're weaker? Well, maybe in this video, but this is not the case with echocardiography, or at least not always. Let me explain what I mean and listen closely because this Will give you an edge over all those who quantify left ventricular function simply based on numbers like ejection fractions. Once you understand the concept, you will understand how the left ventricle copes with a specific problem and you will be able to interpret how the ventricle is really doing. 
Here we have four different sizes of ventricles, a small one, normal sized, dilated, and very dilated. For a certain hemodynamic situation, let's say the patient is at rest, he needs to generate a certain stroke volume. How will these ventricles cope? What I'm showing here is not the myocardial wall, but the motion of the endocardium from diastole to systole. So this here would then be the volume that is ejected. Well, if you have a small ventricle, it has to be hyperdynamic because it has to generate a certain volume. This is the stroke volume. The same is true for the normal ventricle, but it does not have to move so far inward. Therefore, it will not be hyperdynamic, but it will have normal contraction. If the ventricle is reduced, it has to move even less. And if it is very, very strongly enlarged, then it hardly has to move to generate a certain stroke volume. If you look at this geometrically, the volume within this area here is the same as the volume here. But what about ejection fraction? 75, 60, 45, and 30. But does that mean that this ventricle is really better than this ventricle? Well, I would choose to have this ventricle, not this one. What does this mean? For example, it means that small ventricles will always appear more hyperdynamic. But does that mean that the patient has a good function of the myocardium? Well, no, not really, because if he needs to exercise, he cannot compensate any further because he is already at the edge of his contractile function. And what about this patient here on the right? Well, he's probably not off very good either because he has a very large heart and the heart is probably enlarged because his contractile function is not good. So this is his way of compensating. But patients with a poor contractile function can still have a fairly good exercise capacity. We do not know from the rest echo how good this exercise capacity is. To find out if he is compensated, you would need other echo parameters. Those will be taught in our masterclass. Here's one last example to show you the relationship between size and function. A normal ventricle with normal function and a small ventricle with hyperdynamic function which mimics normal contractility. Take a look at the motion of the mitral valve plane and compare it with this here. No question, this ventricle in reality has a problem despite this hyperdynamic function. Are you ready for the next pitfall? How would you estimate left ventricular function here? Well, it appears as if ventricular function is at least moderately reduced. The problem with this ventricle is it is dyssynchronous. It is dyssynchronous because the patient has a left bundle branch block. This means that the different walls don't all contract at the same time. Thereby, it's very difficult to define the end of diastole and the end of systole. Therefore, we tend to underestimate the true contractile function of patients with left bundle branch block. This is another common problem, a patient with tachycardia due to atrial flutter. How is his left ventricular function? It does not appear to be very good, but that still does not mean that it does not have a normal contractility. Maybe the reduction in ejection fraction is just due to the short diastole. Here is the same patient after electric cardioversion, and you can see that his ejection fraction is actually okay. One problem, however, patients who have high heart rates for extended periods of time can develop a so-called tachycardia-associated cardiomyopathy. To distinguish the two in the acute situation is literally impossible. We're not done yet. Here's another difficult situation. If you have ectopic beats, then diastole will be either longer or shorter. This will also make a difference with respect to the ejection fraction and there will be a beat-to-beat -beat variability with ejection fraction. Take a look at these two echoes of the same patient. Here you can see an ectopic beat and note that during this ectopic beat, the ejection fraction is very poor. He also has a more dyssynchronous motion, but this is a different story. The same can also be seen here in the four chamber view. So it makes a difference which beat you take when you look at ejection fraction. And if a patient has very many ectopic beats, it will be impossible altogether. I assume you've probably noticed that longitudinal function is very important to me, but I will show you why. Here's a patient with severe aortic stenosis. Left ventricular function appears to be normal. 
ejection fraction is somewhere in the range of maybe 65 to 70, but its longitudinal function is very poor. Now, this might make a difference when you come to the decision whether or not the patient should be operated or not, whether aortic valve replacement should be done. Now, this is still not in the guidelines, but I'm sure that sooner or later this will be part of the guidelines, or at least it will be also considered for the timing of aortic valve surgery. After all, reduced longitudinal function is now well accepted as an early marker of left ventricular dysfunction. Well, in this lecture, you've seen numerous video clips of the left ventricle so far, so you should have some experience. Sure, you need some more practice, but now I would like to give you the chance to see how you are doing. What is left ventricular function in this short axis view? Give yourself some time. Let's compare it to a normal ventricle. I'm sure you made the right decision. This is a ventricle with severely reduced left ventricular function. Are you ready for the next example? How is left ventricular function in this four chamber view? Here I am comparing it with a normal left ventricular function. Make your choice. Correct. Hyperdynamic left ventricular function. You can see that the function of the ventricle was better than the one I showed for comparison purposes. Let's go to the next case. How is this ventricle doing for chamber view? Let's see how it compares with our normal four chamber view. This is a moderately reduced left ventricle. You might also say it's moderate to severely reduced. So even if you put severe, you were not off. I'm sure all of you did fine. And I hope you were also able to see that it is not so difficult to quantify left ventricular function by eyeballing. Are you ready for a training tip? Something you can do in the meantime until you receive a third part of our ECHO survival course? Okay. I keep pinpointing to the importance of longitudinal function. There is a way to directly quantify longitudinal function without the need of any fancy instrumentation. All you need is an M mode. Do you know what an M mode is? I didn't mention it so far, but it's in every machine because it was one of the first techniques that were used to make a diagnosis with echocardiography. It is basically used for quantifying the size and function of the heart. But in this instance, I would like to show you how you can also look at the mitral valve annulus. But first, let me explain how M-Mode works. M-Mode is not a 2D, but a more one-dimensional method. A ray of ultrasound is sent through the heart the motion that occurs at this line is tracked over time. So it's like a finishing photo during a horse race. Here's a typical application of M-Mode that shows you how it works. We have one ultrasound beam which crosses through the right ventricle, the septum, the left ventricle, and the posterolateral wall. And these structures are displayed along a timeline. So you can, for example, follow the motion of the septum during diastole, and during systole. So how does it help us to look at longitudinal function? Well, by placing an M-mode ray right through the ventricle and through the medial annulus of the mitral valve. You will then get a curve that looks something like this. This allows us to track the excursion of the mitral valve annulus from end diastole to systole and measure the distance. In this case, the distance is 15 millimeters. But compare it with this tracing here. The mitral valve annulus hardly moves. It is probably only 3 to 4 millimeters. You can use these measurements to look at longitudinal function. Of course, you have to watch out that you are really within the mitral valve annulus. But in general, it is a very good way of looking at global longitudinal function. Here are four examples. On the right-hand side, hyperdynamic 
longitudinal function. And on the left, the example we just saw, the patient who hardly has any longitudinal contraction. This concludes part two of our course. If you have any questions and suggestions, please send them to us. And one more thing, to be really good at echo, you need to practice. So use every opportunity you have. And don't be discouraged. The learning curve is shallow at the beginning. But I guarantee you, your competence will grow exponentially. Oh yeah, one final note. Watch out because shortly you will be receiving the third part of our ECHO survival course. There we will be dealing with heart valves.